The first question we're going to tackle today is the most frequently raised question and objection of the Christian faith. And it's simply this. you probably heard it before. Why does God allow suffering? Why would an all-powerful, all-loving God allow pain and suffering in the lives of humanity and the people we know? You realize that more books have been written on this subject than you can ever read in a lifetime. And you probably also realize that there are certainly smarter people out there that can answer this question better than I can as well. And so I'm going to use one of my lifelines, and I'm going to call and ask an expert to help out. So I'm going to be Zooming Jeremy Martini. Uh, he is president of Horizon College right here in Saskatoon and a Bible scholar. And he has graciously consented to me interviewing him this morning. So let's take a listen. Okay, with me right now I have Dr. Uh, Jeremy Martini. He is the president at Horizon College here in Saskatoon, and he has his doctorate in New Testament and Christian origin from the University of Edinburgh. So uh, welcome, Dr. Martini. Uh, you're a friend of Ebenezer. You've been here many, many times, and so thank you for being the first person uh, to join us uh, in this series called Equip You. So listen, let me, let me just cut to the chase. Uh, okay. we're, we're talking about some tough questions about God today. And so one of, one of the, the questions that's probably the most common question that people ask, um, and as we are talking, it's, it's been asked throughout the ages in every generation and every culture, is the question of why. So why does God allow, allow suffering? So how would you answer that? Yeah, um, it's a good question. I say it has been asked throughout the ages, and uh, I think that as Christians, we have a really compelling answer to that story or, or to that uh, question, whether or not people uh, accept it or not. But uh, I, I ask, I ask back, well, why not? So why why yeah. does God allow suffering? Well, well, why not? And the reason I say why not is because the the narrative that we have as as followers of Jesus and previous to us, you know, the uh, Jews as well uh, with the Hebrew Bible. But you have, you have a story of God having started the world out well, um, over, overwriting sort of the chaotic elements and things like that that were, that were and, and imposing order on them and, and making something good, as it says in, in Genesis, declared good. Uh, and then throughout that, then you see the 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 reemergence of these kind of chaotic elements throughout history yeah. uh, that go right to right through uh, the entire Hebrew Bible, the old Testament. And then in the new Testament, uh, this continues on and, and, and then we, we forecast an end. And so there's, there's looking for this time again of when order is going to reign again. But, but in the meanwhile, right now we're stuck in this time where the, the world is broken. It is the the chaotic elements are are back and reigning and and that's that's a problem that's that's just part of our story. So the world is broken. Um, suffering is part of a broken world. And as long as we're in this time between when God created and called it good and that He's going to redeem and 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 make good again, that suffering and and evil and injustice are all part of the package. So it's, it's the default position of the world to be broken yeah. and, and suffering. Part of that. When we chatted yesterday, uh, you, you referenced that you had been uh, preaching through the book of John a lot this last year. And in particular, you've been looking at John chapter 16, verse 33. So do you want to just kind of share that verse and, and yeah, share that with sure. us? Yeah. So, I mean, I think, uh, you know, John sixteen thirty three. Jesus, this is, uh, this is Jesus on the last night with his disciples and he's about to go to the cross and be, and suffer and, and, and be crucified. Uh, and so he's having his final, final evening with his disciples and kind of informing them. And, uh, and at 1633 and throughout, he says a number of things, but, but he, he leaves this, uh, this encouraging little tidbit for his, for his disciples as he's about to depart is he says, uh, he's summing up everything that he says is I I've said all of this so that uh, in me, you may have peace in the world. You will suffer, but take courage, take heart. I've overcome the world. 
And so Jesus tells us, Jesus and his disciples, and frankly, the, the followers of Jesus in the first century, and for the most of, most of history, um, people got suffering. It was the default position. Most people were not in the high elite class. Most people daily life was was suffering pestilence disease all this kind of stuff this was this was part and parcel the the world was really is for most people for most history and for much of the world today remains a hostile place it's it's a it's a place that isn't safe and and neat and tidy and jesus gets this and he tells his disciples look i'm going and he says at the beginning of this, I'm going to go prepare a nice place for you. But in the meanwhile, you're stuck here. And while you're stuck here, it's, it's hostile. But take heart. I've overcome. And that's not the end of the story. And so, yeah, so that's, and that's where I think, you know, we in the West in particular have, have sort of fooled ourselves. We've lulled ourselves yeah. by an illusion that, you know, we've got our, you know, we go get our, our ground beef and it's in a nice, it's in a nice clear plastic wrap. Like it's neat and tidy. We don't even have to worry about blood when we cook meat. You know, there's none of this mess that's involved in, in the everyday life experience. And so we fooled ourselves into this cellophane wrapped existence and something like the COVID-19 comes along. We say, wait a minute, this has disrupted my, my neat and tidy life. This isn't right. This is out of order what's wrong with the world what's wrong with god and god's saying i what's wrong with the world that's the whole problem that we've been talking about all along this isn't new this is this is the normal default position this is just kind of a wake up call that yeah you're in a hostile place you need some rescuing which is the which is the christian story jesus yeah. comes to rescue yeah so. so so given that the default position of the world is is broken and brokenness Mm -hmm. then then what you know the real question is is uh kind of what jesus tells his disciples in the next chapter in john 17 which, yeah which is which is that that he's come to not to take them out of the world uh, uh but to protect them even though they still suffered and and died some some horrible deaths but but that's that's the whole point of the story isn't it it is and and, and so the language and throughout the new testament there's two two themes that come up throughout the whole new testament and and that mark the early christians one of the themes is is variations of the word perseverance persevere 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 endurance and endure 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 and, and this is a common refrain for especially the the new testament followers of jesus is 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 to endure uh, the second one that is unexpected in this sense is hope the word hope characterizes these these followers of Jesus and these are marginalized people like they're already a, a marginalized group of of Jews in a Roman Empire uh, so it's a marginalized group and then you get this other group that marginalizes themselves further from the marginalized group of Jews and and yet they express hope and this hope characterizes them past the New Testament period for the next few centuries where you know you get thrown into the lion's den and you have Christians burned alive and all kinds of things and and incidentally, uh, an epidemic of uh, disease that took place in the third century of Rome. So, uh, and the Christians are there, and they are expressing hope. They are identified as people of hope. They're not afraid of this stuff because it, this is the world. They know that the world's broken. It's not a surprise to them. Yeah, and then even even Jesus coming, like, um, if we didn't need to be rescued from something. <laughs> <laughs> why would well that's why the would story. he come that's that's the story right okay yeah so go you're gonna say something go ahead yeah i was just gonna say i mean that's that's the other part of it when people say why I, I think the question they're getting at is you know this is the old philosophical question you know how could a good god allow suffering like you know and and we get that on a human level on a, on a sort of a i'm gonna call it a microscopic level and and i don't mean to diminish it because all you know i mean i've lost people you've lost people and and uh and suffering is a real thing that we that we face. And so people, well, how could God allow that? Okay, so the world's broken. I get it. Well, why doesn't he fix it then? Is he all powerful? Is he unable to fix it? And the answer hmm. is, well, he is fixing it. That's the whole story. We're saying, well, he's taken an awfully long time to fix it. But he's not really taking an awfully long time. And and now this, this might offend some of the people uh, in the church that 
So to just suspend your suspend your uh, your your science. I can always edit. Uh, I can always edit you out if it's right. not good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can edit it. But okay, so let's just let's just take God out of the picture for a second, and uh, and and just look at human history from a a cosmological scientific perspective, right? And so um, so Carl Sagan popularized this uh, this cosmic calendar back in the days. But but he basically said, okay, so if you take the Earth as being 7.8 billion years old, or not the earth, I'm sorry. If you take the cosmos, the, the everything that we know as being 7.8 billion years old. So you go back and he, he created this cosmic calendar. He says, so let's say everything that existed began 7.8 billion years ago. So we're gonna call that, you know, that's midnight on January 1st. And then you go through everything that's happened, um, the formation of galaxies and stars and planets and earth eventually. And then, and then life on earth and, and then the dinosaurs and mammals and all this kind of stuff. Right. So, and you get right up to human history and, and to sort of homo sapiens, the type of humans that we are. If you took that as a year, then the entirety of human history, everything we know about civilization and human history would account for the last 30 seconds before midnight uh, of the next year. So it is an infinitesimal amount of time that human existence has even been around, let alone suffering. So we say, well, God, how come you're taking so long to fix suffering? And he's saying, Jesus, Jesus promises his followers, look, if you follow me uh, in this world, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take care of you, um, but you're going to have persecution and suffering. Like in Mark 10 here. Uh, but listen, after this, eternal life. So on the scale of eternity, the infinitesimal amount of time of, of suffering that we experience as a human people, as, 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 human, as a human creatures, um, is incomparable to the infinite amount of time without suffering. So it's a kind of a matter of perspective when we say, well, how, how, do we, how come God allows this world to keep broken for so long? Well, from a, from a, even from a cosmological perspective, taking God out of the picture, it really isn't that long. Our whole history doesn't, doesn't amount to much on the scale. Uh, and that's only from then till now, and then it goes on. But from bring God back into the equation, we say, well, look, this, is, this suffering really isn't, it's, it's a very tiny time. And, and Paul Yeah, Paul it's fi says finite. That. Yeah, it's finite. Very finite. And that's why Paul says, you know, in, in Romans 8, he says, this present, your present suffering, and he's talking about the whole cosmos. He's not just talking about humans, but the whole cosmos is groaning, and and, and the present suffering is nothing to compare to the glory to boat to be revealed. So, in that eternal perspective, it's just a drop in the ocean. So sometimes non-believers they they come and say they use the question. So you know, if God is so loving, why why does he allow this? Why doesn't he stop it? And and what would you say to that? Yeah, and that when I say why doesn't he stop it, I say well he's gonna stop it, and that's that's the part that's the advantage that we have as as followers of God. Um, now whether that's persuasive or not to anyone else, but uh, we have a compelling narrative, and so if you look at it, it's like a book or a movie, right? Well, the movie follows the the regular patterns or the book, you know, the story patterns of the you follow the hero through this crisis and this crisis and this crisis and it gets to the climax and then it's resolved and then it's the end and everybody lives happily ever after. But well, on our script, we're, we're still in this crisis mode. We haven't come to the climax and the end and, and everything and everything resolving. So that, so for us, the, the compelling narrative is, yeah, this is, this is just a small part of existence, which God is going to continue to, take care of us and sustain us for eternity uh this is a small part of it so that's that's our narrative and and part of and that's part of our faith and that's where if you're not a follower in god i mean you got to look at your own your own narratives and your own ways of constructing the world but but for us this is the this is a compelling kind of a, hmm. a story it, it, it makes sense of our reality so for us it's kind of like reading the book and feeling all the pain of the book, but, we, but we've looked at the ending already, so we know what's coming, so we don't have to, to panic. Right, and that's our grace, right? I think that's God, that, and that is what, God, I said, hope about the earliest followers of Jesus. That is what gives us our hope, 
the hope is that this isn't it. So if, yeah. you're, if, you, if you don't have that, if you don't have any kind of assurance that this isn't it, then that's a really miserable way to be. But yeah. we have hope. Yeah, back when we actually had sports, my wife used to like to watch a game after it was done and recorded so she knew the outcome, so she didn't have to fret in the middle of it. But maybe that's us right now, right? It's like we, we know the outcome, so why, why, should, we, why should we fret? Because um, you know, even if suffering comes our way, it's finite, and we have something to look forward to. That's, that's brilliant. Okay, let me ask you another question. Uh, th- this is the question that, that's coming up from a, from a few people. Um, and it's a question of, like, is this the beginning of the end? <laughs> Are we entering something? Uh, should, you know, and, and if so, like, what's our response to that? Right. So how would you answer that? Say, yeah, sure, this is the beginning of the end. The end might not be another 10,000 years, but it's, sure, this is the beginning of the end. Um, I mean, this is the, so these things always come up, right? Anytime there's any sort of, calamity in the world it's a, a world war or anything you know suddenly we start to find all kinds of connections to loose connections to uh, to what Jesus said or what you find in the book of Revelation and sometimes twist things around and, and try to make events that are current uh, into very definitive things uh, expressing the end uh, two things on that so um, the one thing I would say to this is, uh, I'll be a little bit cheeky about it, but uh, I 100% guarantee that this is uh, COVID-19 is not the end of existence. Uh, this is not Armageddon. 100%. And you can bet, uh, you go all in and bet it all on this. Uh, no, no loss. Okay, so, so I'm, I'm not, I'm not. Uh, why can I be so convinced of it? And and the reason I'm so convinced of it is, look. So if, if, if I'm if I'm right about that and you say this isn't the end, then, then how you will live is to say, okay, well, I'm planning now for tomorrow. I'm planning for many tomorrows. I'm planning for my, my next generation's tomorrows. Uh, and it matters how I live today. It matters because that's the message that Jesus always gave when he talked about the end. Uh, he said, look, you better be found faithfully living, right? Yeah. Not, not with charts and trying to do, figure out, okay, well, I'm going to be right. Uh, it, you got to be faithful. And so if I know it's not the end, I'm going to live in such a way as expectant always, because any minute could be the end COVID-19 or not any minute. Jesus could say, okay, that's it. Got the work done. I'm coming to get you. But, uh, but if I, if I live expecting that there are many tomorrows ahead, it's, it's going to change how I live. So I'm hundred percent. I say you, you can bet the farm on it. If I'm, if I'm right, then you're going to live better. If I'm wrong, well, then it's the end. It doesn't really matter. So all you'll get maybe is a, uh, is, is a heavenly, someone, you know, in the heavenlies that come up and say, yeah, I told you so, except if they've made it to the heavenlies, then they are, they are themselves probably too pious and righteous to ever come up and say, I told you. So, so it's really no loss. It's, it's a no lose bet. So, so go all in on, there are many, you know, many, 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 years and generations to yeah. come and and live that way but live faithfully because that's the yeah. point live faithfully today it doesn't matter sure. so, so so even like some people have said you know is this god's judgment or something but it doesn't really matter if it's if it's god's judgment or if it's the end times or if it's not it shouldn't actually change the way that we live faithfully uh before god and yeah and god yeah i don't uh i mean yeah, is it God's judgment? And then we start trying to find our hobby horses, the things that we don't like. And surely those are the things that God's judging. Whereas someone else might look at your your thing and say, actually, I think God's judging. You know, uh, God God has made no grand announcements about uh, about a, a big global judgment. I think we've got a virus here in a broken world, and yeah. uh, and the the judgment's going to be if we spend all our time pointing fingers rather than. Uh, being the people of God in this context. Okay. So listen, one, one last question then, and you've kind of answered it, but I'll, I'll, I'll give you one more <laughs> chance to, to answer again. It's like, so, you know, it, what, what's your, what's your advice to the, to the people of God, first of all. And then the second question is going to be, what's, what's your advice to the people that are in a place where they're either actively searching for God or they're not sure that there is a God, but, but what's, What's your advice? Like, what can we learn from 
what we're going through in this narrative right now. Yeah, I think if we're the people of God, we're called to be a people of faith and a people of hope. And that's what, that is what we need to be offering the world. We have that to offer. Uh, you know, the, the people who aren't the people of God might ridicule that hope. And they might say, you're an idiot for, you know, for believing in, in God and all these things. But, you know, that, that can't be what defines us is, is that, that what defines us is that we do believe this stuff and, and we have it on offer. And I think at this point, we need to be offering that to people in a genuine way. We need to express a genuine hope and, uh, and live that out and, and offer it in a genuine way. For those who, who, who aren't people of God and are maybe thinking about it, there's, you know, we, we have a, a compelling, I think a compelling worldview. There is a compelling understanding of the universe that starts with a good God making it a good place and the place going off kilter and God ultimately putting it back on kilter, moving from disorder to order or order to disorder back to order again. Uh, we just locate ourselves in that story in the, we're still in the point of disorder with the hope that it's going to be ordered again and invite those people to, to consider that. That's the whole message of Jesus. Jesus came and when we talk about suffering and we talk about God, our, our story as, as Christians, our, our story includes a God who isn't remote and abstracted, but who entered in. I mean, that is the whole story of Jesus, right? Jesus came into the broken world, took on a frail human flesh, uh, and he didn't live it up like a king. He ended up being crucified in a humiliating and painful way and, and dying. And mm -hmm. our hope comes from the fact that God vindicated him out of that, out of God's justice, rose up. He said, this is an unjust death. This was, this was wrong. And so the, all of that injustice and all that wrongness and all that suffering gets heaped onto, onto Jesus. And, and God says, no, I'm, I'm going to deal with this. And so, and so he raises up Jesus and, and our hope comes from that Jesus is the first fruits. And so he's now putting to rights all the things in the world that are out of order. So he is reordering a disordered world. And he says, look, if you're, if you, come on, join me. Because when this yeah, is done, I'm going to rescue you. I'm, I'm taking you out of this. It, it's, it's a great invitation to live under a new king. It is. It's, it's a brilliant invitation. So yeah. that's, that's what I would say. That's, that's great. Okay. So Dr. Jeremy, thank you for being with us. Uh, I appreciate me. you as a person. I, I enjoy the times we spend together and coughing and just sharing. And, uh, and I, I just, uh, I love some of the things that you've shared today. So, so thank you Appreciate so much it. for being with us today. Thank you. Okay, okay, God bless you. Well, let me wrap up our morning with a couple of concluding thoughts on this topic. First, if you have the chance to talk to one of your friends and they ask you about the question of suffering, make sure you let them know that this is not how it was meant to be. That God created a world that was good, a world where there was no pain or suffering. That suffering became part of humanity because humanity chose to rebel against his creator. And that opened the gate to suffering and the brokenness that we're experiencing right now. But even so, God has promised that he would come again and that he would restore his creation. And he's given us a glimpse of what that would look like when God the Son came to earth and he healed the sick and he restored the broken and he rescued the lost. That's the good news of Jesus the King and his kingdom. And that's the good news we need to tell others about. Second, for those experiencing suffering right now, remember that God doesn't cause suffering, but he does work through it. You know, somehow in the mystery of a sovereign plan and gracious mercy, God takes and uses the, those times of suffering caused by brokenness that sin brought into the life, into our life, and he uses them for his glory. The pages of scripture are, are filled with examples of this, and none greater than the one we just celebrated this last weekend, the death of his son on the cross, and all that that brought to humanity. But even think of your life. 
It's often in times of trials and suffering that we grow the most. I like what C.S. Lewis wrote, We can ignore even pleasure, but pain insists upon being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It's his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. I think we're listening, God. And finally, remember that our suffering will not last forever, nor will COVID or any other suffering that we have. His promise is that one day those who put their trust in him will be with him in heaven, where there is no more suffering, no more weeping, no more disease, no more dying, no more social distancing. Instead, we will be together worshiping and enjoying God for who he is and all his greatness and all his glory. Amen? Amen. Let me pray. Father, thank you for our church family. And thank you for the season that you're bringing us through as a church and as a province and as a nation and as a country and as the world. Uh, thank you that, that you can use these times to help draw our attention and our eyes towards you. And we ask that you would find us faithful in these things. God, that you would find us uh, looking to you and wanting to please you in every way. So God, in these times of suffering, when the world is slowed down, may you draw our hearts and our minds and our eyes towards you. And may you reveal to us your goodness and your greatness in every way. Would you use us, God? Would you protect us? Would you change us and mold us and shape us into the people you want us to be? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks again for joining us. Uh, have yourself a great week, and remember that we love you. Bye-bye.